welcome uh, to this uh, briefing on behalf of the uh, Asia Society, Heinrich Foundation, and the National Competitiveness Council. Uh, this is the first time we're teaming up together, so we're very pleased with both the turnout and the subject that will be presented today. The purpose of today's forum and dialogue is to inform, engage, and act. Our first goal is to inform you about a new index known as the Sustainable Trade Index developed by Heinrich Foundation in partnership with the Economist Intelligence Unit. The index measures long-term domestic and global economic growth goals, environmental sustainability, and social capital. Our second goal is to encourage you to engage our speakers and experts, led by Mr. Merrill Heinrich, founder of the Heinrich Foundation, Chris Clegg, senior editor of the Economist Intelligence Unit, and Stephen Olson, research fellow at the Heinrich Foundation. I encourage you to take advantage of their presence and engage them in a dialogue. And our third goal is to inspire action, to think through the policy implications of the data and the results for the Philippines and what this means for the future direction of our trade policy. So let me get this started by uh, inviting uh, Mr. Fernando Zobel, the President and Chief Operating Officer of Ayala Corporation, uh, to deliver the welcome remarks, but more importantly, I know many of you already know Fernando uh, in his connection with, um, with Ayala Corporation and Ayala Group, but he also is the vice chair of the Asia Society and a global trustee of Asia Society in New York. So, Fernando, let me invite you up here. Good afternoon to everyone. We at Asia Society uh, Philippines are delighted to collaborate with the Henrik Foundation and the Economist Intelligence Unit to bring the concept of sustainable trade index to Manila. We believe this is an excellent way for us in the private sector, as well as for policy advisors and the academe to ensure that our views on the Philippines trading capacity is constantly evolving and aligned with universally acceptable standards. Traditionally, we viewed trade as goods or physical products, whether raw materials, intermediate goods, or finished goods that are transported from one part of the world to another. This later evolved into trade of goods within global supply chains or global value chains, where different sets of components may be manufactured in different locations, shipped to yet another location to be assembled, and then shipped to different locations where markets reside. In more recent years, we have seen how trade has expanded beyond goods to services. In particular, in the Philippines, we have found a unique opportunity to harness this sector, which today continues to be a key growth driver of our economy. Today, we are pleased to be learning about a new and progressive way of measuring our trade capacity that is from an economic, environmental, and social perspective. We're pleased to have with us Merle Hinrich, Chairman, and Stephen Olson, Research Fellow at the Hinrich Foundation, as well as Chris Clegg, Senior Analyst at the, Economic, the Economist Intelligence Unit, to discuss the concept of a sustainable trade index, the methodology behind it, as well as the policy implications in developing sustainable trade practices. We also look forward to the panel discussion uh, with Bill Luce, Co-Chairman of the National Competitiveness Council, joining Chris and Stephen in the discussion. The index covers 20 economies, including the 10 ASEAN member nations. As economies in recent years wrestle with economic and geopolitical issues around free trade, I believe this is a unique and opportune time to take a closer look at the benchmarks, such as the Sustainable Trade Index, to guide the discussions of the economic leaders. Let me take this opportunity to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Merle Hinrich, Executive Chairman of Global Sources, a leading business-to-business -business media company focused on global trade. Merle founded the company in 1970 with the firm conviction that free and mutually beneficial trade would help drive global economic prosperity and ultimately world peace. Merle is also the founder and chairman of the Hinrich Foundation, whose mission is promoting sustainable global trade. Please join me in welcoming Merle Hinrich. Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to have you with us. And 
I want to pay a special thank you to Fernando uh, for assisting and supporting the event and certainly the Asia Society in co-hosting this event. I'd also like to thank Bill and his team, the National Competitive Council. And very importantly, Suyin, I'm sure you'll agree, had done a great job of putting the event together. So thank you very much, Suyin. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're delighted to be sharing the Sustainable Trade Index with you and then a follow-on and dialogue. So why? Why would anybody want to do this? Why would anybody want to take the time? It almost sounds masochistic. And yes, there was a bit of masochism that was involved, I must say. Only did we realize that after we got started. But there was also a hope that we could be able to provide an index that would help understand what it takes to sustain trade. The truth, I have to say, was very humbling. And we quickly appreciated the complexity of this subject we took on. This was some three years ago. It was truly challenging. So we commissioned the Economist Intelligence Unit, or EIU, as some of you may know it, to assist us. And thank heavens we did. Because today I think that we have an index is quite robust, it's inclusive, and um, I'd, I'd, I'll leave it at that, and I'll just share a little background um, of my own involvement with this. I started in Asia uh, in 1964, and that's a little over 50 years ago. It all happened so quickly. I don't know what really uh, I did in those years, frankly. I have had a, an absolute privilege and the pleasure and the excitement of being deeply involved as a student and participant in the development of trade in Asia, both within the region and globally. And what I've witnessed in economic development, like many of you, has been nothing short of absolutely amazing, if not a miracle. From Japan to the Four Tigers, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong, to the more recent entry of China, each has benefited from trade, even though each has a very unique and different form of government, different policies, different economic and social issues. And I'd just like to point out three examples which really touch this subject for me. And that is the alleviation of poverty and the improvement in health and education. Asia's progress in alleviating poverty has been stunning. In the last 20 years, more than 950 million people were lifted out of poverty. But some countries have been more effective than others. So the question in my mind is always why and how. We have seen a rapid improvement in healthcare in Asia. And for instance, inf infant mortality rates have fallen substantially. But not all countries have participated equally in this outcome. And so the question, I repeat, is why. The education systems of Asia have improved significantly from basic literacy to vocational training to university education. And again, some countries have advanced more than others. And you have to ask yourself, what are the circumstances, what are the conditions that work for one country and don't for another? Income inequality represents a major issue for both the developed and the developing world. We have become more attuned to changes in the Gini coefficient, a measure of inequality within countries, and how that may affect, and this is very important, social stability. The latest Gini coefficient for the Philippines is 0.34, which is actually one of the lower in Asia, slightly. And just remember that zero represents total equality and one represents lowest, the, the highest, or inequality. The USA, for comparisons, example is 0.39, only slightly better than the Philippines. But a further example, Norway has an outstanding 
Japan has a outstanding 0.33, and at the other end of the spectrum is South Africa with a 0.63. Quite a substantial difference. So what is the common characteristics with these countries I have referenced? Japan, the Four Tigers, and China. The factor that is common to all, all of these countries, is their participation in global trade. And complemented by a massive investment in their infrastructure. Critical. These characteristics show up time and time again as a factor that assists the individual countries with capital formulation, improved management techniques, enhanced education, and establishing a platform for innovation and development. And yes, that certainly does, as Fernando suggested, includes the development of export service industries, which has been critical, and indeed tourism. The Philippines is really quite unique. How can you possibly question a sustainable economy that is growing at a compounded of 6%? And then in this last Q2, a 6.8%. We should be celebrating. It's phenomenal. But then you pause. You pause and you think about the poverty. You think about the poverty representing one quarter of the Philippine population. Is this sustainable? And you have to be very serious about that question. And this brings me to the importance of the Sustainability Trade Index, which we're going to be discussing. I think you'll agree that one of the major overseas foreign workers which represent an export of manpower, and the BPOs represent, <laughs> representing the export of services in the Philippines, it would be, without those, it would be a very, a very difficult and a very different economic situation here in the Philippines. Today, the biggest Philippine export, export as you, I'm sure, all know, is the export of manpower. There are nine million Filipinos working or residing outside the Philippines, an export that has proved quite resilient. But there are pros and cons. The obvious pro is that it helps solve the domestic unemployment rate, and it enhances the national balance of payments to the tune of some $28 billion per year. It represents almost 10% of the GDP. But the con? The con to this export, as we all know, is that it represents truly a massive brain drain. The Filipinos going overseas are not from the lower quadrant of the population. They are trained, they are technicians, they are construction workers, they are nurses, they are doctors, and there is a host of other very, very productive individuals, which of course is much easier than, which is of course it's much easier making doing this than making and improving the economy, the domestic economy. And as we all know, there are major domestic social problems as a direct consequence of the OFW industry. To what level is this sustainable, or to what level should an economy wish to sustain it? And it is certainly true. It requires certainly less in infrastructure doesn't need the infrastructure. The second largest export, as we know, is out of the overseas that the, uh, the services that are provided by the BPO industry to countries around the world, contributing 7.5 percent to the GDP, but employing only, when I say only, it's still a lot of people, 1.2 million individuals and representing an approximately 23 billion dollars export in services which is also driving the boom in the Philippine uh, real estate market and a whole host of local supporting industries. But this export has its own stresses. Infrastructure, as we can see, is only one. And it has other stresses, both external and internal. Manufacturing in the Philippines contributes 8% to employment. However, manufacturing is down to what it was in the 1950s. And in the last decade, there have been some 73,000 manufacturing firms that have closed shop. 
Of course, and it is true to say that it has been very difficult over the past 15 to 20 years for Southeast Asian manufacturers to compete with China. But times are changing, and there is an improving opportunity given China's increasing cost of labor for some of these countries to regain their manufacturing base. And that is being seen through an increase in foreign direct investment, and it needs to be encouraged. But the problem here is infrastructure again. And what the government is prepared to spend or not spend on infrastructure will have a direct impact on the development of the export of both services and product, without doubt. A good but unfortunate example, of course, we see it every day, is simply the traffic situation here in Manila. And I had a friend say to me this morning, he said, you know, if I want to be home on time for a special appointment, he said, I have to take the day off. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, okay. He fortunately wasn't my employee. <laughs> so, you have to ask yourself, given the success of the, Philippine, uh, the Philippines economically, what could be achieved with, a sustain, with the sustainable investment in infrastructure? Would it facilitate a return of overseas workers to their families? And what contribution could it make to the growth of the Philippines export industry, both in services and in product? Would it enhance economic growth and sustainability? In closing, I'd just say, the whole idea of creating a sustainable trade index was about better understanding and communicating the characteristics of sustainable trade for the benefit of government, for business, and indeed for the general public's understanding, which has become extremely important in today's world, both in the Philippines and certainly in the United States. For the 20 countries and economies that we've evaluated, the index aims to be a baseline for really the present achievements in their economies, in the environment, and social progress that has been made. This index is not about passing judgment on any government's political orientation, actions, or policies. Every country is different, and some policies work better in one environment than another. You've all heard the famous Quotation, it doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white as long as it catches the mouse. And I subscribe to that. And we most sincerely trust that the progress made in the Philippines will endure and that the people will continue to share in the benefits of global trade. With that, may I now hand over the presentation to Chris Clegg of the EIU. And thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Clegg. I'm a senior editor with the Economist Intelligence Unit, and I was responsible for managing the entire project. So that would be from conception of the index, when I can vouch for Mr. Heinrich's claim that we were all questioning ourselves, why, 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 um, through the development and data gathering and to the production uh, of the report. <clears throat> so. Um, my responsibility today is to talk about the methodology, how we arrived at the kind of index that we, uh, that we did, and the results. Uh, so I'll talk about each one of the pillars, and I'll talk about the Philippines-specific performance. Um, starting out, the most difficult thing was to define sustainable trade. There wasn't an existing definition. Uh, the concept of sustainability is generally associated with environmental stewardship or maybe economic development. Um, both of those are very important, um, and we took them into account when we were designing this index. Uh, but the objective of this project was to bridge a gap uh, or fill a hole that we saw uh, between trade and environmental stewardship and economic development. Um, trade, which as Mr. Heinrich noted, has been so instrumental in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty over the last two, two and a half decades. Uh, and it can continue to lift people out of poverty in the coming decades, as long as it's made sustainable. Um, so with that in mind, uh, the definition we developed, and I'll bring it up here, 
Uh, and I'll read this out loud. Uh, sustainable trade is participating in the international trading system in a manner that supports long-term domestic and global goals of economic growth, environmental protection, and strengthening social capital. Now, the, the key aspects of the definition, at least from our perspective, is the emphasis on domestic and global goals. Um, the reason why we include domestic and global is because, as is well known, there are domestic policies or domestic trade policies that are not supportive uh, of a sustainable international, international trading system. And I think Steve will allude to those in his talk, and, and I'm happy to follow up uh, during the question and answer in the panel discussion. But that was the starting point, developing a definition. Um, the next, the next uh, step was developing the framework. Every index that the EIU makes, and we make a considerable number of them, you need to develop a framework for measurement. Um, in this case, we uh, borrowed the framework, uh, an existing framework, from the 1987 uh, Brundtland Commission report uh, for the UN on sustainable development called Our Common Future. Um, what was uh, innovative uh, about that report is that they established the triple bottom line accounting system for sustainability. So we use that triple bottom line, uh, or what we call the three pillars of our index. So there's profit, economic sustainability, there's people, that's social sustainability, and there's plant, environmental sustainability. Um, so building on that framework, my colleagues and I conducted a, a thorough literature review to identify indicators that we could use for the index. And the indicators had to satisfy uh, three conditions. Uh, they had to be relevant, they had to be measurable, or data had to be available. And we used uh, indicators that helped us achieve some parsimony. Um, we then consulted internal and external exports and adjusted the indicators accordingly. At this point in the development of the index, uh, e my colleagues and I at the EIU held numerous very, very long meetings and discussions with the Heinrich Foundation uh, to debate which indicators should be included and which should not. Um, I think difficult as though that process may have been, uh, in the end it proved worth it and necessary. Um, so we ended up with 14 indicators supporting the economic pillar, four for the social pillar, and six for the environmental pillar. Um, the data was collected from a variety of reliable res uh, sources, including the country's national statistics offices, the EIU itself, our internal databases, and organizations like the UN and the World Bank. Um, a full description of the methodology is in the appendix uh, of the report that's uh, on the table in front of you. So I encourage you to have a look uh, if you have any questions about how we've done this. And of course, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions later. Um, two quick notes on the methodology uh, and the index before moving on. Um, why Asia is a common question um, that we've received when we've rolled out this index. Um, there are a few reasons. One is its size. Uh, it's home to two of the three largest economies in the world uh, and two of the three most populous countries in the world. Um, but I think more important than that uh, is that it has shown over the past five, six decades uh, the power of trade to raise people out of poverty. And it thus provides lessons for other countries across the globe who seek to do the same. Um, the U.S., I should note, is included as an external benchmark. Um, and then finally, uh, the index is available for download on uh, the websites that they listed at the end of this presentation. Uh, we encourage everyone with an interest in this topic to download the, X, uh, the index model uh, and data workbook. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, the presentation I'm giving today, uh, the results are all equal weighting. So we use an equal weighting for all three pillars. The economic pillar is 33%, social is 33 environmental is 33 And then underneath those pillars, uh, the sub-indicators are all weighted equally. So social capital, or social, the social pillar has four indicators, 25%, 25%, 25%. Uh, uh, but some of you may not agree with that weighting. Some of you may think that the environmental pillar is more important or the social pillar is more important. Please pay, play around with the index. It'll allow you to see how changing the weightings changes the scores and the rankings. 
So with that said, I'll move on to the overall results of the index. Um, Singapore tops the index, uh, followed closely by South Korea and Japan. Uh, after that, there's a slight drop down to the US and Hong Kong, and then larger drops to Taiwan and Malaysia in terms of the score. Uh, but Malaysia is the best performing uh, emerging country uh, from Asia in the index. Um, that Singapore ranks first is probably not too surprising. Uh, as we note in the report, uh, it has some unique characteristics uh, that uh, make it predisposed to benefit from trade, uh, location uh, being probably the primary one. Um, and no country has really matched uh, the, the performance that is delivered to its citizens over the last 50 years through targeted economic policy uh, and stewardship of, of human and environmental capital. Um, that South and Southeast Asia's poorer countries are at the bottom of the index is perhaps equally as unsurprising. Um, each of these countries has the potential, we should emphasize, to trade more sustainably, but are held back by a variety of factors uh, such as poor export, diver export diversification uh, and underdeveloped social capital. Um, most of you will have noticed by now that these rankings correlate pretty closely with income uh, or national wealth. So we, we saw that too immediately. And to add another layer of analysis to the index, um, we identified those countries that either overperformed or uh, underperformed relative to where they would rank in terms of per capita GDP. And that's what this chart shows. This is also in the report. Um, the overperformers are in dark blue. Uh, the underperformers are in red. And only four countries uh, ranked in the index were, uh, that had a rank equivalent to where their rank would be in per capita GDP. Singapore, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and the Philippines. Um, so they rank the same in the index as they would uh, if this was a ranking of per capita GDP. Um, the most notable overperformers are South Korea, which is sixth in per capita GDP, but second overall in the index for a four-point overperformance. Uh, Vietnam, which outperforms by three, and Laos, which also outperforms by three. Um, just quickly, the reasons for South Korea's overperformance is it ranks first in the social pillar, scoring well on education uh, and its level of inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient. Uh, it's third in the economic pillar, having low costs of trade and strong levels of technological innovation. Um, and it's in the fourth in the environmental pillar, scoring well on water pollution and environmental standards in their trade. Um, Vietnam's overperformance is the result of factors like diversified exports, where it ranks first in terms of the variety of markets uh, Vietnam ex uh, exports to. We used two measures here. One is the variety of the products, and the, and the other is the variety of the markets. Uh, Vietnam does quite well on the diversity of its markets it exports to. Uh, FDI, I think the FDI story in Vietnam is fa fairly well known by now. It ranks uh, fourth. And growth in the labor force. Uh, like a lot of other countries in Asia, uh, it has very favorable demographics. Um, the most notable underperformer, if you haven't uh, noticed this already, is China. Uh, China underperforms by three, uh, three points, uh, although Brunei is the largest underperformer uh, at minus six. Um, why does China underperform so much? Uh, China comes 15th in the environmental pillar. That's probably not too surprising. Uh, 12th in the social pillar and 8th in the economic pillar. Um, this is important because China has benefited, I think inarguably benefited the most from, from trade, global trading system over the past two decades. Um, but that success has not been without costs, particularly in the environmental area. Um, the current government seems to acknowledge this, um, but it remains to be seen whether that acknowledgement will translate into concrete actions. Um, so moving on to the performance of the specific uh, economic pillars, uh, the strongest countries here have low barriers to trade, uh, a diversified export mix, as I've already mentioned, uh, and open current accounts, among other Traits. As I said, there's a number of indicators uh, in this category. Those are just a few. Uh, 
Um, as already highlighted, Malaysia is, is the best performer from emerging Asia. Um, why is this? Well, it's among a group of, of countries that EIU analysts uh, give high scores to uh, in terms of its tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade. Um, and like, like South Korea, it does well on trade costs, which are low, and technological innovation. Uh, and it also scores well on the labor force indicator. Um, Vietnam, again, is a country to watch, uh, as, I already, as I already noted. Uh, besides the diversified export mix, the well-known FDI story, and the strong demographics, uh, it is party to the TPP. Uh, and Steve and I will probably get into discussion about this later. Uh, but if that agreement ever enters into force, uh, it will hold the country to commitments and on, envir uh, on environmental and labor standards uh, that should improve its trade uh, sustainability. Uh, Myanmar is an interesting case. Uh, as already noted, it's kind of a blank slate. Uh, as uh, It's just opened up to the rest of the world. Um, with a newly elected government in place, uh, we have high hopes that, that it and other countries like it um, can draw some lessons from this. Um, uh, every country has, uh, every country can benefit from the findings of this report, but we think countries like Myanmar in particular um, can really benefit uh, since they're just starting out. Um, the uh, specific performance of the Philippines in the economic pillar, uh, it ranks ninth in the economic pillar and outperforms by, by four, four places. So that's, that's encouraging. Why does it outperform? Uh, well, one of the measures we use in the economic pillar is low exchange rate volatility over a five-year period. Now, I understand uh, in the last year or so there has been some vo volatility in the exchange rate, or maybe a little longer back than that. But over a five-year period, the exchange rate has been, been fairly stable. Uh, small foreign trade and payments risk, um, a productive service sector. Um, there are still obstacles, though. It's not all positive. Um, there's an underdeveloped manufacturing set, uh, sector here, which I'm sure you're all aware of and which Mr. Heinrich alluded to. And there are obstacles to attracting foreign direct investment, um, which need to be overcome. But uh, overall, outperforming by four places in this pillar is a fairly positive story for, for the Philippines. Uh, moving on to the social pillar uh, or the people pillar. Countries that score best here have lower inequality, strong labor standards are politically stable and provide quality access to or provide access to quality education um, south korea ranks first or second in, in inequality labor standards and education although it falls down a little bit on political stability um, the u.s presents an interesting case here um, and it highlights how adjusting the weightings which i was speaking about earlier uh, can yield uh, interesting results and interesting insights. Um, so the U.S. does well in labor education and, and political stability, um, although it's not hard to imagine certain scenarios in November where that political stability uh, <laughs> declines. Um, uh, where it scores poorly, and very poorly, relative to per capita income uh, is inequality, uh, where it ranks 13th. Now, <clears throat> Given the rise of populism in the U.S. and elsewhere, uh, a case could be made for overweighting inequality uh, with regards to trade. And again, we encourage those interested to download the workbook and play around. Um, the last point I want to make on the social pillar is the growing, growing role of the private sector. Um, the subject of labor standards uh, has been on the minds of the public and policymakers uh, for some time, but the level of attention it actually receives tends to ebb and flow. Um, in recent years, it's, it's flowed a little bit more, especially following the uh, incident in Dhaka with the collapse of the building. Um, companies that we spoke to for this report said they were focusing more and more as a result of that uh, incident on uh, supply chains and transparency in them. Uh, the private sector is also becoming more involved in the promotion of education uh, and training and to sure, in, in order to ensure that the local workforce meets their needs. Um, there are two short case studies in the paper. Uh, one of these is the Hong Kong Resources Trader, the, the Novo Group. Um, it, it's directly funding infrastructure uh, and teacher training in less developed communities. Um, and the other is Samsung, uh, which has created a smart school program uh, to provide vocational training and job placement opportunities to students all over the world. 
Um, so that's sort of an interesting trend that uh, hopefully will we'll continue and, and continue to contribute to the sustainability of trade in these countries. Um, looking quickly at the social pillar, uh, this is where the Philippines uh, struggled, shall I say, in the index, um, ranking 19th and underperforming per capita GDP by, the, by six. Um, why was this? Well, poor, poor scores on the corruption and political stability indicators, um, and the fourth highest uh, Gini coefficient uh, among the countries in the index. Um, on the plus side, it was in the top 10 uh, uh, in countries that provide a tertiary, sorry, the percentage of the labor force that has tertiary education. So it wasn't all negative, but I think clearly there, there is some work that, that needs to be done here uh, as evidenced by the results. Um, lastly, uh, the environmental pillar. Um, the, best performance, the best performers on the environmental pillar avoid over-reliance on natural resource exports, have low carbon emissions in trade, and are party to the most important international agreements related to trade and the environment. Um, so Hong Kong tops this pillar, and I think for any of you who have actually visited Hong Kong, this might come as a bit of a shock. Uh, <laughs> um, but I want to emphasize that this is a sustainable trade index. Um, so yes, Hong Kong has bad air some days, uh, but that's not necessarily Hong Kong's fault. Um, and it's not necessarily related to trade. Um, Hong Kong is a trade hub with few natural resources of its own. Uh, a good record on reforestation, which was one of the, one of the indicators we used for this pillar. Um, and rakes second only behind Singapore in, in terms of water pollution. Uh, that's according to the Yale Environment Index. Uh, sorry, Environmental Performance uh, Index. It's also party to all seven of the international trade and environment agreements that we included uh, in the rankings. Um, and then, the, interestingly, the local shipping industry, uh, which is probably the source of, uh, of most of the pollution in Hong Kong at the moment, has pursued self-imposed standards on low emission fuels. So there's a lot uh, uh, of encouraging trends in, in Hong Kong, and that, that's why they, they score so well. Um, the Philippines, uh, in, in another bright spot uh, in, in the index, ranks sixth uh, in the, in, in the, on the environmental pillar. Of, but there are a bunch of countries sort of bunched together in a tie, um, or a near tie. Um, second place uh, on air pollution. I guess that's due to a relative lack of a manufacturing sector, uh, among other things. Um, and the Philippines is party to a number of the international uh, agreements that we use to score this pillar. Um, I guess the last point I'll make here before, before handing over to Steve um, is the potential for new trade agreements to Im improve the sustainability of trade all over the world. Um, and to spur countries to make improvements in environment, uh, environmental standards and labor standards. Um, the TPP did disappoint um, many environmentalists, for, for example, who were hoping for far more stringent disciplines uh, to be imposed on the member countries. Uh, but a lot of the people we spoke to uh, for this report uh, were optimistic that even if that is the case, uh, the TPP can provide a good ro roadmap for uh, improving those standards in the years to come, which is to say maybe the TPP itself from day one uh, doesn't, doesn't help environmental labor standards as much as some people hoped it would, uh, but that it's, it's a good place to start. Um, and maybe Steve and I can talk about the prospects of TPP later. Um, but uh, I'll close there, and, and uh, thank you for listening, and hand it over to Steve. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're very pleased that you're able to join us, and we're happy to see uh, such a large turnout. Um, before I begin, uh, perhaps I should take just a quick minute and uh, introduce myself to you a bit. Um, as you heard earlier, I am a research fellow at the Heinrich Foundation uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, my career started uh, many years ago, and in fact, uh, more years ago than I would like to admit. Uh, in Washington, D.C., where I was a U.S. trade negotiator. And I served on the U.S. negotiating team for the NAFTA negotiations and the U.S.-Canada free trade negotiations 
uh, before that. In the years since Washington, I've spent uh, my career in Asia and the Middle East, where I've held uh, different positions in the private sector, NGOs, and think tanks. And in, in addition to my uh, current position at the Heinrich Foundation, I'm also a, a visiting scholar and an adjunct associate uh, professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. So that's the, the perspective that I, I bring to these issues. Um, OK, well, now that uh, Chris has provided us with a very good overview on the construction of the index and the overall results that it produced, I'd like to say a few words about some of the policy implications that the index seems to be pointing us towards. Uh, to be clear, however, it is not our intention to provide specific policy prescriptions to individual countries. But uh, the results of the index do seem to suggest what I would refer to as at least a few broad themes that we think will be useful for policymakers to keep in mind uh, as they chart their course forward. So the first, the first theme that I would like to mention, theme number one, is sustainable trade is a marathon and not a sprint. Now, I know uh, many of us have been enjoying very much uh, watching the Olympics from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in recent weeks. And we've probably enjoyed, in particular, uh, the very exciting victories by Usain Bolt in the 100-meter dash. Uh, unfortunately, however, uh, Mr. Bolt is not a useful role model for us when it comes to sustainable trade. Um, in order to be a successful sustainable trade nation, policymakers will need to approach trade with the perspective of a marathon runner, not a sprinter, and be very discerning in the ways that they engage in international trade. In essence, what the index is telling us is trade, yes, but not at all costs. The challenge is to think strategically about trade while avoiding the temptation of short-term payoffs that can damage trade sustainability over the longer term. So, for example, uh, pursuing an export strategy around a non-renewable resource while failing to make sufficient investments in an education system that can produce a skilled labor force that can move up the value chain would seriously undermine a country's ability uh, to trade sustainably. So policymakers will need to evaluate short-term and long-term imperatives and carefully study the, the trade-offs. Now, while we understand that trade is an essential ingredient in economic development, um, we also understand that it can bring with it potential risks, things like labor market dislocations. It can impose environmental costs. Uh, it can bring, uh, and it can exacerbate income inequalities, to name just a few potential risks. But with the right mix of policies and the right mix of sustainable trade policies, these risks can be managed and reduced, and trade can proceed on a more sustainable manner. The key question that policymakers need to be asking themselves is this. Are the policies that we are putting in place today setting up our country to succeed in trade, not just tomorrow, not just in one year, but five years, 10 years, and even 15 years into the future. Okay, remember, uh, sustainable trade is a marathon and not a sprint. The second theme that I'd like to mention is developing sustainable trade practices support rather than undermine economic development. Now, interestingly enough, this, this was a point that was very clearly illustrated in a document which many of you might have seen, the recent World Bank economic update for East Asia and the Pacific. And in this document, the World Bank recommends that governments in the region spur growth and development by making investments in a series of public goods, things like education, health care, and social safety nets, while at the same time pursuing greater income equality and exercising better environmental stewardship. Now, if you'll recall, these are precisely, precisely the types of issues that Chris was just talking to us about 
under the economic, social, and environmental pillar of the index. And at least in the opinion of the World Bank, these are the areas where we need to invest in order to promote growth. Okay? Now, these recommendations made by the World Bank also happen to dovetail very nicely uh, with a related point that is made by the OECD, which is called for countries to strive for mutually supportive policies, or what the OECD refers to as policy coherence across the economic, social, and environmental pillars. Now look, we all, we all understand that occasionally there will be unavoidable trade-offs between these different pillars, but there will also be opportunities for mutually uh, supportive policies. So for policymakers, the bottom line is this. Sustainable trade practices should be seen as a central part of your economic development strategies. It helps support economic growth. The third theme that I'd like to mention, theme number three, is use FTAs to bolster sustainability, to strengthen sustainability. Um, governments in the region should press for the inclusion of more meaningful labor and environmental provisions in free trade agreements, in regional trade agreements, and in multilateral trade agreements. Doing so will improve sustainability across supply chains and within economic regions. Now, of course, let's, let's be frank, and this is something that Chris alluded to, uh, the environmental and labor provisions in many of the existing free trade agreements leave a lot to be desired, and in some respects are fairly modest. But the point is, they're a step in the right direction, they represent gradual progress, and progress needs to be con continued to be made. As this happens, we will come to see free trade agreements as being tools of sustainability, which will help uh, promote further sustainability. Uh, the fourth theme that I'd like to mention is the rest of the world is watching. The rest of the world is watching. Um, what I'm talking about here is simply this. Uh, multilateral development agencies are carefully assessing the sustainability of countries' uh, trade practices when deciding on aid packages and other forms of assistance and capacity building. And it's not just the MDAs. It's not just the multilateral development agencies. It's also private corporations as they make decisions about where to provide their foreign investments. They're also evaluating a lot of these very same issues. Now, we've always understood that FDI, foreign direct investment, is important for uh, economic development and economic growth. But we're now learning that foreign direct investment is actually even more important than we previously thought. And I should mention, uh, just as a side note, uh, that the Heinrich Foundation has been supporting uh, some groundbreaking research looking at the profound impact that foreign direct investment has had on China's remarkable economic rise. Now, as the Philippines is increasingly positioning itself as an attractive destination for foreign direct investment, I think we can um, assume, or at least hope, that we'll see an increased influx of FDI into the Philippines. It might be worthwhile for policy officials, business leaders, and other interested parties to take a look at China's experience with FDI and see if there are useful lessons that could be applied here in the Philippines. But whether we're talking about foreign direct investment or whether we're talking about assistance and capacity building from multilateral development agencies. The key point is that sustainable trade policies will make your country a more attractive destination. Now, those are the four themes that I wanted to run through um, uh, briefly. Uh, what I'd like to do now, if I may, is just offer some, uh, some, general, uh, some general observations from my perspective. Um, I'm sure, all, as everyone in this room understands probably just as well as I do, if not better, trade has been a remarkable uh, engine of growth and has lifted literally hundreds of millions of people out of poverty over the last uh, six or seven decades. 
It's no secret, though, that in recent years, support for international trade has been dropping precipitously. Okay? Average citizens, both in developed countries and developing countries, are increasingly questioning whether or not trade, quote unquote, works for them. And even in the United States, which has been a traditional bastion of support for free trade, we've seen a surprising drop in support for free trade agreements. Um, I don't know if some of you might have seen it, but there was a poll this past spring put out by Bloomberg, which actually indicated that for the first time in recent memory, a majority of Americans are now in favor of increasing restrictions on imported products rather than decreasing restrictions. And as I'm sure you've all seen, this anti-trade sentiment, sentiment has been reflected very clearly on the US uh, presidential campaign trail, where both candidates range from being trade skeptical to being outright, uh, to being outright protectionist. Now, whether we're looking at the presidential campaign or we're looking at the discussion more broadly about trade, we see that a variety of criticisms have been raised. Now, frankly speaking, some of these criticisms are legitimate, some of these criticisms are not legitimate. But what I'd like to draw your attention to in particular is how much of this trade discontent and how much of this question, uh, questioning of trade relates directly to the issues that Chris was just talking to us about under, uh, the, environment, under the economic pillar, the social pillar, and the environmental pillar. In a sense, and to a certain degree, much of this trade discontent reflects the fact that we've not yet adequately addressed sustainable uh, trade issues in our trade agreements. So by pressing for greater sustainability, we can at least hope to moderate uh, some of the opposition to trade and solidify the base of support uh, for free trade. One, uh, one, final, one final thought I'd like to share with you. Um, from the perspective of the Heinrich Foundation, and in terms of why we went through uh, the masochism that was referred to earlier in, in putting together this sustainable trade index, we, we really view this index as uh, an invitation to dialogue. Our objective in putting it together was to create a platform or a framework uh, for discussion. We certainly, and I, I want to emphasize this point in, in no uncertain terms, we do not think that we have all the answers. We do not think that this is the final word on sustainable trade, far from it. So I want you to know that we very, very, very sincerely welcome and quite frankly need your input and suggestions. So I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to uh, start a dialogue with you here on these issues uh, this afternoon, but we look forward to also continuing uh, this dialogue into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen and, and, and Chris and, and Mr. Heinrich for your, for your remarks. Uh, now at this uh, point in time, we have, uh, we have a lot of time for, for, for questions. And I would really encourage uh, the audience to ask questions and take advantage of their, uh, the presence of, of Stephen and Chris up here. So the, the floor is open. Um, do we have microphones scattered around the floor? Um, Oh, here we go. All right. Got the first question. Okay, Mr. Uh, Hans Sikat. Okay. Hans, for the benefit of all, maybe I'll ask you to introduce yourself and your organization. Hi, uh, my name is Hans Sikat. I'm from the Philippine Stock Exchange. Um, so, by the way, thank you for the uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm Hans Sikat. I'm the CEO of the Philippine Stock Exchange. And I guess, uh, as you said, uh, Steve. Uh, we've seen basically a backlash against global trade and, and, and perhaps a, maybe the comparative advantage concept that goes along with it. But uh, here in ASEAN, if you look at the ASEAN model, clearly a lot has been done in terms of trying to reduce uh, tariff barriers. I think about 90, 90, 95% or 98% has been basically now down to zero. And as we're moving or trying to move forward, the question is, when you have such a backlash uh, of uh, this concept, and we see basically in the Western countries that uh, there's a protectionist movement, 
And, uh, you know, how does that affect uh, not just ASEAN, uh, in the, I'd say the near to medium future, but even prospects for even developing ASEAN as a more uh, tight economic, uh, let's call it area, where examples abound that things don't work. And you got Brexit there, and, and TPP is probably not moving, and, and you know, uh, I guess complaints against NAFTA, and so on and so forth. So, clearly, I guess that my concern is that are we going to get stuck with the ASEAN concept not moving forward, or is there uh, any more hope to, for it to develop further? Well, uh, thank you very much. You've, um, uh, you've certainly asked the $64,000 question. And if I had a crystal ball, I could give you an absolute answer. But let me uh, share with you at least some, uh, some thoughts. I think what you've identified is very disturbing. And it remains to be seen what exactly the shakeout will be if we slip back into uh, protectionist tendencies we're not even slipping back to protectionism, just see a waning of enthusiasm for, for, for trade liberalization. I think it remains to be seen the exact impact. Certainly from ASEAN's perspective, if the United States does take a turn uh, towards uh, greater protectionist sentiments, this will have implications because um, despite any recent stumbles the U.S. has gone through, it, remains to be, it still remains uh, the world's largest uh, consumer market. More broadly, I think it's an open question. Uh, what, um, the United States has been the traditional leader and the traditional driver uh, behind the global trade system and the move towards more open and free trade. I don't know what will happen, frankly, if the United States abdicates that role of traditional uh, a driver of labor, liberalization and the global trade system. So it remains to be seen, but I think you've identified some troubling trends, and I think we're just going to have to watch it closely and see what happens. Can, Thank I, you. can I make a point? Yeah, please, go ahead. That? And then we'll go to Noel. Um, I think two points, really. Um, one is it's not a backlash against trade in some of these countries. It's a backlash against constituent parts of globalization. Um, so the Brexit, I think, you can make the case very easily that the primary driver of Brexit was immigration, which is a component of globalization, but not really related uh, to trade. And I think there's some mix like that in the US as well. Um, so it's good to keep that in mind. It's not necessarily anti-trade first. Um, and the second uh, point I would make about this sort of anti-trade or anti-globalization and rising populism is that um, the governments and uh, I can't speak specifically for the Philippines, but the business community uh, around the world does an awful job of selling trade to the public, really, really bad. Um, and and this is I could speak specifically in the U.S. and some other countries. Um, and I think a lot of at least the private sector, and, and I can speak from the clients that we're getting now at the EIU, have come to the realization that they have not done a good job on this. Now. Um, it might be a, a little, little late, or as Steve put it, like waking up in the fourth quarter, uh, but I think that would be one of, the, one of the avenues for countering this, is actual education on trade and globalization. So like the anti-TPP uh, voters or the Bernie Sanders uh, wing of the Democratic Party, they're anti-TPP, but they don't know what it is, most of them. I bet if you ask 95% of them if China was the agreement, they would say yes, right? Um, because into a vacuum, you can fill anything, right? So I think education is really, really important. Thank you. Yeah, Noel? Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Noel Bonan from KPMG in the Philippines. Well, first of all, I'll commend you on, um, I'd like to commend you on the, on the study. I think it adds to the discussion around GDP being an adequate measure of development. Um, and also, of course, the effort to look for other models of measuring countries' development. My question are two questions. Um, the first is, is did you measure the, the speed of a country's development, or is that implied? And second, I'd like to know when the next, when you're running the survey again, oh. certainly to see how, um, you know, how countries have developed or, or regressed. Well, the Thank second, you. answer to your second question is, is up to define people at the Heineken <laughs> Foundation. When we, when we run the second version, like, oh, sorry. Um, I think everybody heard that. Um, and the first question, I didn't catch the end of that. Sorry, could you repeat? It was yeah, something um, about you know, did, did you the Did you measure the, the speed of a country's development? Was, one of, was, was that part of the measurement? Okay. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, or is this just implied in, you know, in the rankings? Yeah, so we considered this at the outset because really 
ideally what we would have done is to construct this index so you can go back and look at how, how sustainable did Japan's development look in the 60s, right? How sustainable did South Korea's development look in the 80s? But there's just so many data problems there, we could have never done that. We, we wanted to consider the speed of development, but um, the, for the indicators that we decided we wanted to include, we just couldn't do the data for 1960s Japan that didn't exist. So I think that's a very good point, but it's, it's impossible to do. And the next, the next study you said is going to be dependent on what uh, yes. this gentleman is we're, going to we're do. We're in right. discussions. We're <laughs> when was the first study done? Maybe just so everyone knows. When was the data collection so we know kind of the context here? Oh, um, it, was pub it was published in April. April, April. It was published in April. The data collection was done from uh, September 2015 until early this year. So the data is sort of 2014 and back, right? And, and we're anticipating that the index will be produced every two years. Okay, okay next, uh, next question. Yes, I see a question here. Uh, hi, good morning. I'm Brian from ILO. Uh, I'd like to ask if you looked into the effects or impacts of trade on employment, especially how export sectors are uh, creating jobs or uh, losing jobs because of uh, international trade. Okay. Um, so the labor indicator is in there for that reason. This isn't an index that measures through econometric means the impact of trade on employment. We read all of the studies that do that when we were going through the process of selecting the indicator. So this report doesn't do that kind of analysis, um, but you know, it, is, it is a fair question. There are, I, there are some interesting papers that are starting to come out about the effects of, of trade uh, on employment levels and are, are sort of challenging the assumptions that economists have already always made about labor mo mobility. Uh, one paper in particular I would suggest is, it's, although it's come, it hasn't been without its critics, there's a paper called The China Shock uh, that attempts to estimate the impact on uh, labor in the U.S. from China joining the WTO. Um, so interesting work is starting to be done on this, um, but I think there's no, there's no consensus yet. Yes, please. Ji Kyung. Wait, Ji Kyung, let's give a minute for the microphone to be brought up here. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you have set any kind of outcome or impact variables that you want to keep track of to see what kind of contribution or larger impact that you are trying to achieve beyond the descriptive effect of the index. Uh, you, you mean what, what we'd like to accomplish correct, the, and correct, how we're Correct, impact. I, I think our primary purpose in putting out the Sustainable Trade Index was to provide countries with an opportunity to look at what other countries have done, to look at countries that have been successful in pursuing sustainable trade, other countries less successful, seeing what works and seeing what doesn't work. As, as Mr. Heinrich mentioned in his remarks, this isn't a one-size-fits-all type of uh, a proposition and what worked well in one country might not work well in another uh, country. So our primary purpose and the thing that we would be most gratified to see would be if countries could um, observe the experience of their, their neighbors and their colleagues and draw and apply any appropriate lessons in their own domestic and local context. Speaking, speaking of impact, uh, Stephen, is there a uh, is your thinking to try to create a, or develop and find out a correlation between the sustainable trade index and say, you know, global economic development? I know it's only a small 20 uh, countries now, but if you, if you enlarged it, because uh, right now what's happening is that, uh, you know, people are looking at, at regional trading blocks, the free trade mm -hmm. uh, agreements, TPP, RCEP, ASEAN, Pacific Alliance, so on and so forth. But uh, is, is, does the data suggest that you know, if, if, it, if scores were lower in sustainable trade, then global economic growth would, would slow down and, and vice versa? Is there, is there an early indication of that? Do you want me to take this one? Um, so you're right to point out that a 20 country sample size is not big enough to, to reach those conclusions. That wasn't part of our mandate this time around when we were working with the, the Heinrich Foundation. But once the sample size gets up to 60 or 80, 
then we can kind of start playing around with it and see what sort of implications there are, what correlations there are um, with certain global indicators. Um, I don't know that GDP is, I mean, we, GDP is the easiest to do, uh, but I think, as the, the gentleman from KPMG rightly pointed out a moment ago, um, that measure of, econo of, of, of the economy, of society, is coming under an increasing amount of pressure as not being really indicative of, of progress. So there's a lot of interesting things we can do, I think. And I, and I think what, one thing we've seen already is that sustainable trade practices do seem to support economic growth. Okay, any additional questions? Yeah, there's a microphone here. Yeah. Mr. Heinrich. Um, thank you, Dr. Kong, for your, your question, and I'm just referring back to Bill's as well. Uh, this is the first iteration. Uh, we had to put a parameter around the size and the depth of this. And what we're looking for, we're indeed looking for, is any input as to what we have missed in this index as it stands, what we should be adding, both in terms of the horizontal being more countries, and if there are countries that are and should be included in this comparative, we would like to have that discussion um, from a number of you in this room who I know have spent a lot of time on index and index-related activity. That would be extremely helpful. Um, so this is the beginning. We put it to two years. The reason for the two-year um, period is to get feedback again and then to prepare for that expansion and roll it out so that we can see what changes have taken place, to give it enough time to see what changes have taken place in these three pillars, both the economic, the environment, and the social aspects of it. One year we felt was not really adequate, so we needed a little bit more space in that. Uh, we may change that uh, eventually, but for the moment uh, we're happy with that. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the floor? Yes, please. Hi, from Regina. Regina from Bloomberg, that is. Um, Steve, uh, to your point about it being not a one-size-fits-all approach, when you look across Asia, even just ASEAN, of course, we're talking about vastly different countries, and therefore, um, you know, there's uh, different stages of development as well. What sort of role does technological readiness play into your assumptions? For instance, automation. We can talk about sustainable trade ad infinitum, but then the future is here, as they say. For an, and there was, a, in fact, a, a recent study, I think, from the International Labor Organization that said something like, what, 167 million jobs in ASEAN at risk because of automation? Well, I, I think you raise a very, a very good and a very uh, interesting point. Um, one thing people have to recognize, they, they, they talk about manufacturing and the importance of manufacturing, and that's certainly true. But I think people need to bear in mind that most manufacturing industries don't bring with it anywhere near the number of jobs they did five years, 10 years, and even 15 years ago. That's how rapid the pace of automation has been, and robots have simply taken over a lot of these jobs. So whereas we're traditionally accustomed to manufacturing being a sector that can really generate a lot of employment, the fact of the matter is, due to automation, it's, it's, it's generating a lot less employment. So that's certainly something that has to factor into this discussion. Yeah, and if I could just tie this back to the initial question, um, uh, I think the, the rising populism across the world, the solution has been, or been proposed, um, not least by one of the candidates in the US, that uh, bring manufacturing jobs back to the US. Well, when those jobs left, say for example, a, a garment company, when it left in the late 90s, it employed 6,000 people or something. If you bring that back from China or Bangladesh now, it's gonna employ 100 people, 150 people, right? So that's just not a solution uh, to, the, to this issue. Yeah. The, uh, did you have a follow-up question? Uh, Sort of. I mean, and so I guess one of the things that the study is, is trying to uh, propose is that, well, there's something here that says about, uh, talks about the Philippines skipping the manufacturing step, which is uh, something we're all aware of. But then given how fast the world is changing, I guess my question is, is this still the right way to go? Um, is, that, is that still something that needs to be overweight 
in an index like this? Or should we be looking at other industries, moving up the value chain, so to speak? Uh, is your, do you, uh, I think either one, I, I can go. Okay, um, so yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, the traditional path of development has been agriculture manufacturing services. Um, and I think there are some real concerns about this uh, phenomenon with the long sort of unwieldy name called premature deindustrialization, right? So a lot of countries are not getting rich, right, by the time that they're, they've reached peak manufacturing output. So that's a real, I do think, a real cause for concern uh, among countries in the Asian region, especially in ASEAN. Um, how exactly to combat that, I think, is really a subject for debate. A lot of people talk about skills and training, uh, but there's not been a lot of concrete actions. I mean, I do think that's the only solution, um, but there haven't been a lot of con concrete actions taken to address the, the lack of human capital, which is sort of a coarse way of saying skills and training. Thank you. Yep, there's a um, traditional view of trade, of course, as, as you said, manufactured products, but for the Philippines, it's actually trade and services, which is uh, more important for us. So automation will affect uh, services as well. Yeah. Uh, the index, is it, is it tracking, is it, do you contemplate weighting uh, or, or putting in more data that has to, to do with trade in services as opposed to trade in, in manufactured products? Um, th sorry. Uh, this run of the index, no. Uh, but one of the reasons that we're having these discussions with uh, audiences like this is to get feedback just like that. Um, I mean, when we started research on this, automation was a concern. I mean, it's been a concern for decades. But I just I think it's been in the last two or three years that it's really picked up steam and is now picking up even more steam as a topic of discussion. Um, so that's definitely something I think we need to consider. Um, the, if you go back to my presentation, the three criteria are relevance, um, measurability, and parsimony. Right. So measurability is a tough one. So we've had we had so many debates about how to measure these indicators. So um, if it's relevant and it's measurable, then it's something we will we'll strive to include. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Sinan Perlada, Export Marketing Bureau Director, Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, thank you very much. I congratulate you for the study that you have made. I just want to make a comment. It fits in very nicely with what our findings were, in fact, for the uh, Philippine Export Development Plan 2015 to 2017. Uh, all the findings that you have actually resonate in our, in our plan, and we hope to be able to leverage on that to get more of our policymakers convinced. Sometimes it takes an outside party to, to convince a lot of decision makers with where we should go. And we are about to craft the new, um, what you call this version of it, for the next three years. And I think this will fit in nicely with that. Now, to add to the comment of uh, Hans, I guess, and, and um, uh, Bill, did you consider, for example, the study also made by McKinsey recently about digital globalization and how you know, data flows have actually gone so fast that we have not actually <laughs> made progress on trade in goods and services precisely because you know, governments are very active in negotiating free trade agreements. But digital globalization and getting interconnectedness and, and trading in effect in data does not need any more free trade agreements. So the example given was think of 3D printing, for example, where a Japanese exporter can actually export you know, a, a, a knitwear uh, that is actually designed and, and, you know, programs being done in Japan, but actually being produced in the market, you know, as close as it can to the market. So these are the things that were, I think we, we should input into the study that you have made, because then it will give us an idea of what the future will be. Because I can understand, and this is also the same problem that we've had when we did the Philippine Export Development Plan. Yes, we looked at the data from 2006 to 2015, but that's the past. What do we really do in order to get to the future? And we need more information <coughs> about the, what the future holds uh, for the country. So that said, uh, 
I, I guess one, the, it's a question and also a suggestion that perhaps in the next, in the next version you may want to consider the data flows as far as your study is concerned. Thank you. What, what, one quick comment. We're, we're very pleased if you think the work that we've done will be relevant to your export plan. I'd certainly like be, be very interested yes, to sir. take a look at it. <laughs> you, you, you said that you don't want to be prescriptive with governments, but I think they're, they're asking precisely for some support. Uh, <laughs> they need a little policy support on, on, on their side. No? But uh, yeah, thanks, Anand. That's a, that's a good point. Uh, I, I was going to ask, if are you able to tell uh, even in your 20 country sample, uh, in terms of, of trade and sustainable trade, uh, uh, which countries are uh, faced with a situation where it is uh, more trade means you know job creation or job loss? Because I think that's one of the the, the trends we see now bit behind protectionism, which is you know more trade leads to loss of jobs domestically in whatever economy uh, people happen to be talking about. So. Is there a way to, I know it's sort of picking winners and losers sort of thing, but uh, is it possible to do that in, in, in this? Because then maybe then the next suggestion might be, you know, maybe we need you know, more trade because one of, the, one of the findings and the themes you said here was trade, yes, but not at all costs. So, you know, how are we going to, to policymakers need to understand and, and measure that? Part, part, part of the difficulty is kind of factoring out the impacts of trade. I mean, labor markets are constantly in a state of churning, constantly in a state of flux, and it's very, very difficult to isolate and say these jobs were lost or these jobs were gained as a result of trade. So that's one of the mm -hmm. fundamental difficulties you're, you'll encounter in that. Yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons that it's not in the index is because the indicators that are in the index have something resembling a consensus around them in the academic community, which is why we did the literature review. Uh, and, and it goes back to the question earlier uh, from the gentleman from the ILO. Uh, one of the big debates in, in employment economics is trying to, to sort of isolate the impact of trade versus technology. Right? It's very difficult to do. A lot of people are asking about automation and machine learning. It's very difficult to separate, separate the two. Um, so if we could figure out some way to do it, this will be a very popular index next time around, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, the crystal ball will get clearer. Yes. <laughs> okay. So a couple comments, and this comes back to the technology side of it. And this is just an observation, and uh, it's my personal view, is that I think that the Philippines is actually very, very well positioned uh, given the popularity of the BPO and the ability to fulfill that need for the reason, the following reason. It's participating in the knowledge industries of the world. It is front line with the consumer. The consumers, they have touch with the consumers. They have touch with the businesses. They know the problems. They know the issues. And this dovetails in a way with the digital uh, economy, which is your software and your interfaces, uh, your UIs. Uh, all of this is very positive, I think, for the Philippines in their growth of the export for services. With regard to industries, and this is a separate note, with regard to individual manufacturers, you have to think very carefully about the multiplier effect of what industries can you afford to encourage to develop, whether they are going to cause you uh, supplementary problems, in the example in the auto industry here, and the financing of cheaper auto loans, and the impact that that has on, of course, traffic. Okay, so there are a lot of these variables with which you have to look at uh, quite carefully in your development of trade. But I think the Philippines is incredibly well positioned to participate at many different levels. Okay. Thank you. And we have the, let's take the last question <coughs> here from this lady. Uh, hi, I'm Wei Wen Wang from Taipei Economic and Culture Office. And thanks for including Taiwan in this research. Research, I think we are in, in definitely uh, be some policy uh, recommendations, although you don't really want to do it. But I just have a small uh, comment uh, regarding the uh, uh, selection of data uh, that I uh, found through uh, your research. According to your research, I found that uh, our country, Taiwan, uh, ranked uh, 20th as the last country in the in the environmental standards. Uh, so that 
that part, that rank uh, actually uh, make all the other rankings like lower. Mm. So, and I just found that be uh, it's because that we are not participating in like, for example, Kyoto uh, Protocol or COP21 mm. for certain reasons. But actually, our government has applied those <coughs> rules into our domestic laws. Yeah. So I think that might not uh, reflect uh, the real situation in Taiwan. So maybe some adjustments uh, could be made, would be better to reflect the results. Thank you. The debate, and we, we debated this specifically, um, uh, about in, it's sort of punishing Taiwan for something that it has no control over, really, as the sing signing these international trade agreements. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, not being able to sign them does, I think, make in small part Taiwan's trade less sustainable. Uh, but you also make a good point that um, they are implementing some of these uh, some of these standards without uh, without having signed the agreement. So that's something I think we'll have to take into yeah. consideration next time around. Yeah. So thank you. It's it's a very valid point. Thank you for bringing it to our attention. Okay. Um, first of all, we've run out of time, and I want to thank everybody for. Uh, your participation and your, your questions and suggestions. I think they got suggestions as well. No? Um, when I was first approached by Asia Society on behalf of the Heinrich Foundation to have this uh, little forum, the first thing that came into my mind was, oh no, not another index. Uh, <laughs> at NCC, we, we eat, drink, and sleep indices, as some of the people know here. So, you know, having, you know, tracked more than a dozen of these, uh, we, we thought, oh, we've seen, you know, so many indices and sometimes we, we set them aside if we, if we don't uh, think uh, they're particularly relevant to the Philippines. But this one, I think, uh, is. No? So, uh, I, I think it's been a very useful exercise. And as the old adage goes, you know, what gets measured gets managed. And I, I think this is the value, I think, of, of indices like these. And um, I can see I'm happy to see the Department of Trade is here because, you know, it, this bolsters some of their, uh, their, their policy arguments. It also maybe reinforces or forces them to rethink maybe a number of them as well. So I, I, I think this is a, a, a good uh, a practice. So uh, I'm, I'm happy that we were able to pull this off. I'm happy that in spite of so many functions all going on at the same time in different hotels around Makati that we're... We, we have, everyone got their share of crowd. Uh, I know we're being divided in so many places, but we're, we're thankful you're here. Uh, we're thankful to, to Heinrich Foundation and to EIU for putting the study together. Um, it's a great uh, piece of work for a first uh, pass, and uh, we look forward to, to maybe having every you know, couple of years a, a presentation and to see where we're going and, and are we progressing globally and are we progressing as a as a country. So please join me in thanking uh, Steve and, and Chris and, and Mr. Heinrich, uh, Asia Society, <laughs> for, for putting this together. And I think you've got, each of you have the report, and I'm sure Suyin has more. Uh, if you want more, maybe Suyin give a lot to DTI to bring back to their uh, XCOM. And uh, on behalf of the organizing parties, I, I'd like to thank you all for a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. you.